Uh, I need to ask my husband to pay the babysitter. Oh, perfect. We'll I'm not used to the squeezed and tangled. <laughs> yeah. okay. We can squeeze and pull. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's more intimate. I suppose. I know. I still can't, like, reach you. I bet you could. Try really hard. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. But before, I say they were over there, we were way over here. It was like and you know, the dragons yeah. and the snakes yeah. all, yeah, all over. Yeah, but now it's like, you got to turn, it's just, I feel like we're, our backs are to half the people. Just you and me. Yeah, right? Just you and me, yeah. It's fine. Oh, my gosh. I used to have Kevin was facing this way because there was only that screen. Hello. It used to be that Kevin, Bruce, and Chris, and then I was on the other side of Kevin. And so they would have a whole conversation. <laughs> I just put <laughs> Well, I'm deaf in one ear, so also it's like you easier are. for me. Yeah. So, so if you ever see me, like, like your neck moves, my left ear. So you can only hear on your right? Mm hmm. I was born that way. Well, I wasn't good. I mean, I wasn't yeah. No, no, no. I'm just saying in general. Just offering up more information about this, you know. Yeah. But it's been like that my whole life. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. I don't want to hear if I'm going to yell. In yeah. Ear, yeah. I know my kids are always like, which is the one you can hear in? <laughs> I'm not as boss when I'm here. Hi, friend. How are you? We're good. Hi, friend. Little weather. I just noticed. I just looked at my window. Oh, right yeah, it's boring. Sorry. Big fat. Ruth, I'm setting an alarm because I have to leave at eight because my ride for the evening got COVID, just like everyone else in this world has COVID right now. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody has it. Oh my God, everyone has it. Oh. I'm still on my nose and run. I can't even say it. You probably have had it and you didn't even realize it. Every time I, I said Novid, that's when I got it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Do you No, it's getting my kids. Oh, okay. Is there something you want me to fix? Because, you know, I'm at that age that all my kids, their activities start yeah. at 8 o'clock at night. And they're not old enough to. Yes. yes. Like, no, I remember that. <laughs> what happened to the 4 to 5 stuff? Now it's all like yeah. 7 to 8, 8 to 10. Don't forget. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just concerned about the absence of gallery chairs. Uh, if we need them, people can pull them in from the library. Okay. You think that many people are in? What's that? You think that many people are in? No. Oh, it's raining. Oh, oh. oh did you see my text? It's a million dollar school budget. I'd probably not. Kevin's gym is amazing. Not bad, huh? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was uh, took well a long branded. time. Yes. So well. <laughs> we, listen, it's, it's part well of the we are, right? We, we um, do that well. I mean, I, if I had to wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. to, uh, I'm a little like. <laughs> So who is he's in there with who? Um, I think the whole football team. Is it the football team? Yeah. That's great. Um, go from did you see the dates? Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. So it's have to, it's, um, I didn't make the change on the slide, so we'll make the change in the issue. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I would see, but I would just want you to be surprised when I say them in my that yes. next Tuesday. It's a matter of Set my alarm. Oh, just tell me the night before. Yeah, I think about what happened. We want to work through that one. Uh, he, is, he will be we can uh, talk. We'll talk entering yeah. college as a 17 year old. He's very young. Yeah. He started kindergarten as a four year old. So September. He's so mad about that. He actually was never mad about it until he just realized that he'll be driving. Yeah. Yeah. My son was the same way. He was four. Very late. Like, kindergarten. Yeah. He was driving. But back then, he's so old. He was only three months before he could drive fast. It's so weird. It wasn't, it wasn't now a year. Maybe it was six months. It's six yeah. months. Yeah. 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 He can drive his yeah. siblings in six months. Yeah. But I feel like three nobody, and nobody six. does that. Like, I love the birthday. Everyone I know is like, oh, oh that's exciting. The kids have the life of the first day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, isn't that something? One, two, three, I don't know what you guys think. Katie realized that she had. I'm going to present for you. Yeah. 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 So rather than, it doesn't make sense. Oh, for one camp. Yeah. Yeah. For camp. Yeah. And I'm just on the one camp. And I won't go to the line. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll set it up. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. When's her birthday? August 26th. Mm-hmm. It's like November 5th. And then it's... Oh.
remember getting a card contingent on the fact that I had a card all my brothers and sisters around every place. So, yeah, there was no waiting time in New Jersey when I grew up. Yeah, see you later. Yeah. It's funny, New York had a law when I was a kid. You, at age 16, you couldn't drive after nine. Yeah. Uh, and then I, when you're in preschool, that was a year. Where was that? You really do. Then you have to go on the house. Yeah. My first the year of teaching, I taught part of me just wants to go and be like, and I was still I was like, like at home so the whole year. Teacher, um, <laughs> because they're all wet and you're all the time. Yeah. Yeah. They're all over you all the time. Yeah. That's yeah. So you just, I would be nervous. Yes. And then you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's a year. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> How many of our friends have Vermont plates on there? That's crazy. Is that why? For tax or for property tax? For property tax or whatever. Yep. No. All of us. No. One of the fun ones like Coxsackie. Okay. Oh, I'm a dutiful citizen. I register my car. And I only want one house. Oh, that's going to be the most fun. fun. <laughs> when you say that word, we all start to get. Although it makes me want to build something on my brother's Can farm sooner rather than it. later. Honestly, I did study on it because I have a lot of it. It's 7 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Try to keep us on time. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, just a few things to get through tonight, right? It's like, yeah. um, so it is 7 o'clock on Thursday, January 12th. I call the um, Wilton Board of Education regular meeting to order. Is there a motion on um, to review and approve the agenda? Can I ask a question about that? You may. The two policies, there's just two. One is a spacing issue and one is a word change. We already got it. it should be. Yes, in the, the yes, in the packet. Yeah, yes. Oh, but that was for the consent agenda. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we just haven't gotten there yet. But we'll just double check. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Yes, sir. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Um, comments from the public. The board has set aside time at the beginning and end of regular meetings for public comments for members of the public to share their matters. On, to share their views on matters involving the Wilton Public Schools and to help inform the board's decisions on such matters. For the record, please state your name and address. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to any one subject. The board considers the views of citizens in its deliberations and welcomes and appreciates public comment. The board listens to the public comments thoughtfully and with interest. The board, however, generally does not respond to public comment during meetings by offering commentary or answering questions. The board invites commentators and the public to contact the board or the superintendent directly with any specific questions or comments. The board, through the chair, and the superintendent may respond to questions and comments offered during the comment period or shared directly with the board or superintendent. And in responding, may also direct members of the public to the appropriate staff members for a response. Is there anyone in the room for a public comment? Good evening. My name is Andrew Niksaji. I teach math to eighth graders at Middlebrook School and am president of WBA. 90% of Middlebrook teachers are opposed to proposed staff reductions in the ELA and math departments and the proposed block schedule. I would like to read a letter authored by 12 dedicated Middlebrook language arts teachers. Dear Board of Education members, Thank you for taking the time out of this meeting to listen to the concerns that we have regarding the proposed changes to next year's schedule at Middlebrook School. We recognize that this meeting time is valuable and only wish to help guide some of the decision making. Please know that we believe that all of the people involved in this decision making process have good intentions. We wish to voice our concerns so that when you make recommendations to Dr. Smith, you are able to do so through the lens of classroom teachers. First and foremost, we care about the English language arts instruction that Wilton students will receive in the future at Millbrook. 
We believe that the children have been wonderfully served since the middle school model was first introduced in the school, since it offers a focus on the whole child through maturity into young adulthood. Having two English language arts sections has afforded students the time to delve into richer literary, literary experiences. Strong instruction in ELA also serves to lift student achievement across multiple subject areas. Students in Wilton have done incredibly well under the current model, having grown exponentially last year to the point of being recognized by the state of Connecticut for outstanding achievement. The proposed block schedule will cut ELA instruction time and curriculum by 51%, which we believe significantly will impact student learning. Another concern is the inclusion of a nearly hour and a half long skills block that will occur every other day in the proposed schedule. While some students will be receiving special education or intervention services during this block, the bulk of students will be going to their team to be with teachers for an undefined and currently unstructured period, which we believe is not the optimal use of time for students. Additionally, students in reading intervention will need to continue to be pulled from stride periods. We would be remiss if we did not say that we believe all of our ELA colleagues are outstanding educators and should remain as teachers at Middlebrook. The children of Wilton have received extraordinary educations and we are concerned that their learning will suffer as a result of the lost curriculum time and the marked reduction in our department staff. We would appreciate the Board of Education's continued careful investigation into all aspects of this proposed new schedule. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration. Signed, 12 members of the ELA Department of the Work School. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the room or online? Consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Yes. All right. Um, that leads to the board's chair report. Um, good evening and happy new year. Tonight, Kevin will present a proposed 2023-24 annual school budget. Kevin will brief the Board of Finance next Tuesday, the 17th. Every budget season, the BOE also holds a series of cost center specific workshops. The workshops will be held from 1 to 3 p.m. on Tuesday, January 24th for Miller Driscoll, Cider Mill, and Middlebrook, on Wednesday, January 25th for Wilton High School and Athletics and Special Education, and Thursday, January 26th for Digital Learning, Technology, and the District. Agendas for the workshops will be noticed shortly. The workshops are also recorded and posted. The budget will also be discussed during our regular meeting on February 2nd and at a special meeting with the, the Board of Finance on February 9th. Discussion will conclude with a vote at our regular meeting on February 16th. The Board relies on stakeholder input. We invite and welcome public participation. The budget documents will be posted on the BOE website as they are released. Please send your thoughts, comments, and questions to the board at boe at wiltonps.org. The public hearing on the budget has been set for Monday, March 27th. The Board of Finance has set its budget deliberation meeting dates for April 3rd, 4th, 10th, and 11th. The fiscal year 2024 annual town meeting is expected to be held on Tuesday, May 2nd, with adjourned voting following, on, following the meeting and that Saturday, May 6th. The board continues to evaluate the recommendation to adopt an AB block schedule at Middlebrook beginning with the 23-24 school year. The proposed schedule change is not on tonight's agenda. The board will discuss and deliberate during the Middlebrook portion of the budget workshops on January 24th and at our February 2nd regular meeting and on February 9th with a possible vote. Please direct any comments or questions about the proposed schedule change directly to the board, Dr. Smith and or Principal Higgins. Finally, 
A special recognition and a big thank you to the Wilton Turnover Shop for recent contributions to the four PTAs of about $18,000 each. In more than one way, it pays to give. Thank you for those who can sign, donate, and purchase, and thank you to the Turnover Shop and all your volunteers. I'm sure the PTAs are happily planning programs and grants. And just for a point of clarification, does the five PTAs include seven? Oh, yes. Right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Kevin. Well, you're going to hear plenty from me tonight. <laughs> uh, I would just, uh, kind of, in, you know, extension to the recognition of the uh, turnover shop. Over the last few weeks, just before the break, and then uh, this week, I've had the opportunity to drop into a number of PTA meetings, and you know, then monthly I meet with the um, PTA, PTSA, and SEPTA president. And um, I just want to recognize all of them for their incredible partnership. They spend countless hours um, leading and guiding their respective volunteer organizations. Um, I was really struck by the parent participation. Uh, most recently, uh, Nicola and I were together here in this room with the high school PTSA. And um, I don't think there's enough gratitude and recognition for that group as they um, they really they, they work in partnership and it's been fun to listen to their different reports and updates because um, you know as we've discussed briefly in the past this year really does you know continue to mark a movement out of that COVID environment and so there's so many more um, student activities that they're sponsoring um, that really you know just um, amplifies the quality of school life for kids and I'm really I'm grateful for that so just wanted to say thank you okay um, next on the agenda is to review and discuss um, the ELA update and it reflects board goal number four Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I checked it off before I got there. <laughs> I'm going to back up for Hold a second. Up, yes. Hold that thought. <laughs> what? Do you want to do it next time? Oh, we can do it next time. In the interest of you know having a full agenda, is that is there a motion to move committee reports to next time? committee? I move that we move the committee reports to next meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay, so good evening everybody. Um, we're going to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on in, in ELA, particularly what we've been doing since the last review. Um, at our last meeting, I think it was, I gave you a very brief update about the legislation. I'm not going to repeat that, but we will um, kind of weave in some of that information throughout the presentation. Um, I did want to clarify just the process around the waiver. So. Um, it's February 28th, we will be submitting a approximately 30 page uh, waiver request to the state. Um, the, was it yesterday or the day before we filled out the survey notifying the state that we are going to be um, submitting that waiver? And we'll discuss more about that during the, the presentation. Okay? I'm going to turn this over to Karen. Sure. Can you advance the slide, please? Oh, here. I have trigger, uh, that's Thank dangerous. You. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Um, so we're going to go, I'm going to move kind of briskly. We have five parts we're going to talk about tonight. And I just want to encourage us to keep our youngest learners central in the conversation, um, as we always do. Um, there's a great deal of um, science and research around the complex and invisible process of learning to read. Labels like the science of reading as they are used in podcasts and in media sound bites are um, deepening the divide in education rather than bringing our brightest minds together um, to collectively improve our process, our practice, excuse me. This isn't about politics, it's not about reading wars or sound bites, it's about our children learning to read and how we in the Wilton Public Schools as an educational agency will ensure that all of our students secure unfinished learning from the pandemic to become skilled readers. 
The aforementioned research undergirds the programming we currently have. Teachers College has historically recommended the use of a word study program to supplement previous incarnations of the reading units of study. One important purpose of phonics instruction is to develop the brain's orthographic processing system, bringing letters, sounds, meaning, and text and context together. What has changed since the 2017 edition of the phonics units of study to the comprehensive program is that TC has integrated the science of phonics acquisition with the science of reading comprehension. What we now are charged to do is to assess if the changes, both TC's and our own local curriculum decisions, have been sufficient for all of our students to become skilled readers. We need to keep our children and their needs central in this work. Connecticut statute has historically left programming and methods of instruction to the discretion of local educational agencies. It's one reason we have processes in place, such as our five-year curriculum review cycle, so that we can monitor students' response to our curriculum decisions. Um, so tonight we're going to talk in very just briefly in quick parts, five parts. First, we're going to talk about the curriculum review process um, from 2020. Then we're going to talk about the legislation. We'll talk about our curriculum and how it plays out in our K-8 schools. And then we'll talk about how our children are doing with that curriculum. And finally, we'll wrap up with next steps. This graphic I've presented to the board before, but with changing membership, it bears revisiting. Along the left of this slide, you'll see eight skills. These are all backed by brain science and research about learning. These two categories of skill, word reading at the top of the slide and language comp comprehension at the bottom of the slide are each important in their own right. But ultimately, they weave together and they form a rope that gets stronger and stronger as the cords of word reading and sense making become increasingly automatic. One text that we are leaning on and studying closely with our TC staff developer this year is by Birkins and Yates. Um, it's called Shifting the Balance, and it articulates six ways to bring the science of reading into the balanced literacy classroom. This text is one way we are learning to integrate best practices from both sides of the divide, both reading science and comprehension literacy, comprehensive literacy. So then on the next slide, we're going to talk about where we've been with the curriculum review. Um, fortuitously, in 2020, we started that work just before lockdown. Our five-year curriculum review process establishes a committee representing, represented by teachers from each building, coaches from each building, parents from each building, students from Wilton High School, and a representative from the Board of Education. In 2020, Jen Lawler represented the Board of Education on the ELA curriculum review. The committee met three times, totaling six hours of in-person study, and the process also required a commitment outside of those meetings to ensure that we were all grounded in the same research, issues, trends, and achievement data. Thanks again, Jen, for, and all of the committee members for their um, engagement and their good thinking work in that process. Next slide. No, back up one for me. So it's my fault. In your handouts, I've given you a copy of our program philosophy. In 2019, prior to the ELA curriculum review, we invited the Tri State Consortium to give us some feedback by engaging in a consultancy protocol with our district. After reviewing artifacts, interviewing teachers, and visiting classrooms, one observation that the committee made was that attempting to translate our program philosophy into a compliance checklist would not serve the district well. The work we are engaging in, the work of growing skilled readers, is complex, and we recognize that no one box of instructional resources will meet the needs of each and every emerging reader. Our partnership with Teachers College, a think tank, gains us access to ongoing research in the field so we can continually work to refine our practice. As a result, our program philosophy was revised during the 2020 review to include bullet numbers five and six on your handout under core principles, integrated vocabulary and grammar instruction, as well as to emphasize the importance of growing lifelong readers. This philosophy undergirds the district's portrait of the graduate and aligns with our district vision and mission. 
On May 8th of 2020, after a, uh, after a review of issues and trends, the Curriculum Committee ratified that the ELA programming, professional learning, and professional collaboration focus on these five areas. As you can see, our organization's attention to foundational skill acquisition, vocabulary acquisition and use, the construction of background knowledge, and the language development embedded in grammar instruction precede this unfunded, unfunded legislative mandate that passed in sections 294-404 of the budget implementer bill in June. We've been steadfastly proceeding with this work in a fiscally responsible manner since the spring of 2020. In 2020-21, despite learning to teach in the classroom with social distancing measures, um, plexiglass sneeze guards, masks, and quarantining, our kindergarten through second grade teachers embarked on full implementation of the TC phonics units of study and engaged along with grade three in professional learning about phonemic awareness specifically. Following this election day professional development from Hegarty, grades kindergarten through second grade began implementing a supplementary phonemic awareness instructional program. If I could just interrupt at this point. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much you know about phonemic awareness, but it's the ability of students to perceive and discriminate sounds. That's probably the most important pre-reading skills our, our students can have because if, you, if that's not intact you can't map an understanding of letters on top of that uh, and it's a, a kind of a hallmark of dyslexia so I'm very proud of the work that they did with that and uh, Karen's going to share with you some data that shows that we've made some really good strides with our students around phonemic awareness no, thank you. I appreciate that. We're gonna we'll talk. We'll revisit that shortly with a more in-depth um, definition. In 2021-22, our talented teaching staff continued to take on new approaches like the accelerated learning framework to be responsive to growing readers from where they are to grade level standards in a district-wide concerted effort to address unfinished learning. And in 2022-2023, our kindergarten through second grade teachers once again pivoted grade one, most notably as a publishing company that publishes the units of study, Heinemann delayed the publication of the new reading units of study that were revised to align to word reading research. Even as Ed Reports published their review of TC's 2012 reading and writing units in January of 2020, Teachers College was hard at work with reading research experts, including Tim Rosinski, one of the Ed Reports reviewers, to revise reading units of study to incorporate word meaning research. Ed Reports, by the way, is one of the, or the website that the state is relying on to um, determine the programs that they're recommending. If your program is not on Ed, Ed what is it called? Ed, 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 Ed Reports. Um, it's unlikely that they would approve it. You can advance the slide. Thinking in terms of future steps, what's upcoming still from the five-year curriculum review process that we have not tackled yet. At Miller Driscoll, we'll continue with our implementation of the reading units of study published in 2022 in kindergarten and grade two, as grade one begins to refine their implementation. At Cider Mill, we'll resume our study of our word study program, which is called Words Their Way, with a particular emphasis on vocabulary and phonics instruction instruction in addition to spelling in tier one. At Middlebrook we will more closely align to our instructional framework for comprehensive literacy as we integrate our language arts courses into one. As we engage in this work we'll continue to move forward in a learning stance supported by a comprehensive and effective intervention system and continuing to aim for 80% of our learners reading at grade level with only tier one instruction.
dramatic effect. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly all of our third graders began the 2022-23 school year with their phonemic awareness learning secured. That's and amazing. That's all. Ninety-nine percent of them. This a tremendous effort on the behalf of our K2 staff. Amazing. In 2018, by contrast, interventionists in third grade were creating rhyming small groups. Chuck talked about phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is all oral and auditory and can be done in the dark. Rhyming is the most simple of those nine skills that are that we are teaching into in phonemic awareness. So having third graders unable to recognize and or produce rhymes was alarming, um, to say the least. Um, it inspired a case study of students transitioning from Miller Driscoll to Cider Mill um, that informed many of the recommendations forwarded during the 2020 curriculum review. Now we'll explore the legislation passed in 2021, which seems to contradict some Connecticut statute that has historically left programmatic and curricular decisions to local educational agencies like the Wilton Public Schools. The legislation systematizes a statewide reading response based on what the media calls the science of reading by requiring the state to oversee all state and local efforts related to literacy, including setting reading curriculum requirements for districts, providing professional development, hiring external literacy coaches, and coordinating with teacher preparation programs. A newly established Center for Literacy Research and Reading Success will be the hub for that work. For our district, the, le the legislation is an unfunded mandate, as only Alliance districts will receive the professional development and literacy coaches the legislation names. Do you want to explain what an Alliance district is? Sure. So <clears throat> there are a number of districts in Connecticut that have been identified by the state as underperforming. I believe it's about 30 to 33 school districts. Um, the state monitors what those districts are doing very closely, particularly around literacy. Um, each year, the uh, districts have to submit a strategic improvement plan that there's a whole list of requirements for those uh, strategic improvement plans, um, and they need to be approved by, by the state. I would like to point out that um, across the state, 52% of the students who are below grade level are in the Alliance District. Which, Alliance districts, which I find interesting that the state is now expanding their reach to schools outside of the Alliance organization, you know, outside of the Alliance districts, and yet they have not yet shown themselves to be able to produce the results that they're seeking. I'd also like to point out that none of these programs that they recommended have evidence that they are getting all of their students to grade level. As a matter of fact, in the districts that I have seen that use that, we are at a much higher level of getting kids to grade level than they are. All said, um, I mentioned before, we will be in a learning stance as we move forward. Um, on December 1st, the first sample kits of the instructional resources recommended by the State Department of Education, Core Knowledge ELA by Amplify Learning, arrived in my office. This summer, we'll review any of the state-approved instructional resources that align to our program philosophy. Of the seven now approved, two appear to be in some degree of alignment. The cost of these materials is nearly half a million dollars for grades, for our grades included in our elementary school classrooms. This includes one year of digital access, which will need to be renewed annually, and only two days of professional development for our teachers at the launch of the new programming. You can advance the slide, please. Is that the next one? That's the old one. It's not a Florida now. Fun. <laughs> Can you make it forward? I'll keep talking while they, they do that. You received a document in your handouts from the right to read Connecticut.org. That enumerates the timeline for this legislation. 
There are a couple of pieces of information that are important to note there. The committee approved instructional resources that must be evidence-based and focused on competencies in oral language, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, rapid automatic name or letter name fluency, and reading comprehension, as our 2022 TC reading units of study do. The second thing that's important to note is that important deadlines have been missed along this timeline that um, have made decision making challenging, such as publishing the list of the approved programs, which was scheduled to be announced on July 1st of 2022. As named earlier, I just want to repeat that we can never move forward with programming or practices that we know are not meeting all of our learners' needs. So as we planned for programming for 2022-2023, we followed the recommendations of the Curriculum Review Committee and moved forward with the revised units of study. We had submitted, we had submitted an 82-page document to the Connecticut State Department of Education in May, delineating how the program we planned to implement satisfied the requirements outlined in all 25 of the committee's criteria. It appears the committee did not review the program in its totality, the reading units of study, the writing units of study, and the phonics units of study. And the most current ones. And it appears that they may not, that they did not review the 2022 version of the reading units of study, rather the 2012. So many of the districts have repeatedly requested information on what they did review, and it's crickets. They're not even answering us. The list of approved instructional resources was published on September 29th, just shy of three months later than promised, and just as budgeting for the 23-24 school year began. There simply was insufficient time to review the instructional resources to ensure they meet Wilton's rigorous standards. Um, as I mentioned, I received the first of these three resource kit samples to begin a thorough review. Um, the materials were received on December 1st. Um, I believe we're going to conduct that review alongside with another vendor's approved materials this summer. The Office of Curriculum and Instruction intends to review the materials that most closely align with our program philosophy and have a fiscally responsible decision about moving forward as we enter the budget season for 2024-2025. We intend to apply for a waiver, as Chuck mentioned at the onset, and I'd like to emphasize that our decision making will remain grounded in selecting materials that support all of our students in becoming skilled readers. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> the next section of our presentation tonight will focus on the curriculum we currently have in place. One source of professional learning on which we are leaning at the recommendation of our former primary level TC staff developer, Angela Baez, is a book study of Shifting the Balance, which I mentioned before, by Jan Birkins and Carrie Yates which was published in 2021. As we implement the new reading units of study published in 2022, we are attending to these six areas of foundational literacy instruction. Treating oral language as an essential ingredient for comprehension, committing to intentional systematic phonemic awareness instruction, explicitly and systematically teaching how to crack the written code, creating opportunities for children to pull apart phonemes and high priority words and match them to the graphemes that represent them, prioritizing print as the first resort for, as the first resort for word solving using meaning and structure to cross check, and intentionally selecting or creating text sets with the decoding opportunities students need to practice. Just this afternoon, we met with um, the team at Miller Driscoll, the coaching team and the intervention team to look at some data and we'll discuss that in the next section, but there were some really um, encouraging data um, emerging from that work. Our program is comprised of a system of curricular components which is driven by a comprehensive instructional framework grounded in explicit instruction. When the program is reviewed, when a program is reviewed, it is critical that all four components be examined as each supports the other, leading to the transfer of learning that our teacher representatives from Miller Driscoll on the Curriculum Review Committee reported. 
Their reports of students' response to the instruction, coupled with a slight uptick in assessment data as a result of piloting the new phonics units, is what drove the committee's recommendation to continue with TC Phonics and curriculum and instructions decision to purchase the new revised reading units of study. Our partnership with TC is so valuable because the organization is not just a vendor. Rather, TC is a think tank of educators who research and refine their collective practice and knowledge on an ongoing basis. The revised reading units in grades kindergarten through second exemplify this, partnering with national reading researchers. Among this esteemed group, were several experts in reading and brain science like Tim Rosinski, professor of literacy at Kent State University and director of its award-winning reading clinic, as well as Elfrida Hebert, a vocabulary acquisition expert, lead researcher, and author of one of the state's newly approved instructional materials collections, Savas Learning's My View Literacy, which was published in 2020. So now we're going to talk about what this learning looks like in each of our schools. And I've invited one of our talented coaches from Miller Driscoll, um, Rosemary, would you come on up and join us? Great. <laughs> She's going to bring Frazier. Such a fun game of employer roulette. Hello. Welcome back. Rosemary is going to bring the kindergarten through second um, grade curriculum specifically to life for you this evening. And then I'll give you a brief overview of third through eighth grade. Sure. All right. I'm going to go one part at a time. OK. So yes, I came to give you a little flavor of what this actually looks like, and I'm going to be super uh, concise in this. So as Karen mentioned, Hegarty, our phonological and phonemic awareness curriculum, has nine different skills. I'm going to give you just a taste of the two most sophisticated skills so you can kind of get a sense of what that looks like. Um, and you might be wondering, why? Why does this even matter, right? It sounds like fun. You can do it in the dark. Flashlights. It's all about listening. Well, as Chuck indicated, um, PA is the precursor, really the foundation for all things decoding and encoding, so all things reading and writing. Um, and students who are apt to be proficient with their PL, PA skills are more inclined to become proficient and skilled readers. All right, you guys ready to play with me? I'm going to talk to you like your little friends, OK? So the first game we're going to play is called What's Left, because it has to be kid friendly, right? I'm not going to say, OK, we're going to delete the initial phoneme today, friends, because they're going to be like, what are you talking about? Um, but when you delete a phoneme, you're going to take away the first sound. And again, this is actually quite important. So. We are going to play What's Left. All right, are you ready? The word is, I'll model first. The word is bone. Without the b, what's left? Bone. Um, see how I stole away that first sound? Isn't it super fun? Are you ready to play? <laughs> You're playing like it or not. All right, the word is cake. Without the k. Cake. cake. Thank you. Rope. Without the er. Oh. OK. So that's deleting the first phoneme, right? Because you have to be able to hear it first before you can recall it, identify it, manipulate it, right? And then eventually decode it and encode <coughs> it. All right? The most sophisticated skill is substituting, substituting phonemes. So we switch out the first sound. Sometimes it's a single letter phoneme, but sometimes it might be two letters together, like a blend or a digraph. It might even be more than that, but we're going to go relatively easy on you guys. I know it's a late evening. All right, so switcheroo, all model. Again, to make it kid-friendly and enticing, right? Because who wouldn't want to play switcheroo? All right, so the word is tank without the t. Oh, no, sorry. I'm too stuck in my old game. So we're going to tank, change the t to a b. I have bank. See what I did? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to try? OK, bank, change the b to an er. Rank. Rank. Yes. Rank, change the er to a th. Thank. Thank. Yes, see how it just got a little more difficult, right? We're switching one sound to two sounds, so our digraph there. And we would pr proceed through that. And teachers rely on data to get a sense of what kids in the class need. And then they would, of course, tailor the number of examples provided. And they might even skip certain sections of this, again, based on data, or only do that a couple of times a week. Are you sitting in front of a kindergarten class right now doing this? I could be sitting in front of kindergarten, first or second. Or pre-K. So pre yes, and pre-K. Pre True. It's just so quick. So I mean, normally when we do something like this, we're all sitting on the rug. We're all gathered together. Um, oftentimes, I recommend to teachers that they physically move themselves around the group of students. Because if I'm only ever hearing Maria, and if I'm only ever he hearing Andrea and Karen, then I'm not so sure about the proficiency level of the rest of you who are like far away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like I will like do rhyming, say, over here, and then I literally 
literally move myself and then I literally move myself so that I have a stronger sense um, and kind of glean some informal assessment data along the way. All right, so that is a little flair for Hagerty. Are you ready for some phonics? Yes, that was not rhetorical. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you are. So, so great. Okay. <laughs> so our phonics units of study are based around particular skills. Um, the phonics unit that first grade is about to be embarking upon is called word builders because everything has like a fun, thematic, engaging um, story arc to it. And so we're talking about building words, right? So building words that we can read, building words that we can write. And this unit is about vowel teams. Most vowel teams are actually diphthongs, but in terms of student friendly, we just call it vowel, uh, vowel teams, meaning two vowels together, not always a vowel, the second one comes together to make one new sound or a host of sounds. Good luck, people. Okay. <laughs> so readers, writers, oh, so confusing because really as letter lovers or phonics wizards, right, you're, you're doing all of this together. <laughs> so we letter are going letters. to be learning something new today. What is this? I have a clue from Rashid. He's our phonics mascot. Let's see what it says. Word builders, I really need your help with my project, but there are more vowel teams for you to learn. Here's a clue for you to build your vowel team chart. Read page three and you'll see two new teams. What? And then it tells me to read page three. Oh, you're going to see the sound, same sound as ooh like in school, but it looks completely different. Can you believe that? Okay, I'm going to read this page to you. You guys are going to identify, you can put up your hand like a stop sign when you hear the ooh sound. And then, of course, I would have this under the doc camera so students can see it, right? Jack's And this is a book they're already familiar with. Jack's tummy growled, he thought. The sun is up, the sky is blue. <gasps> Fishing class, A plus. What a great day for tumbleweed stew. Oh my gosh, let's study those words super closely because you might be surprised. It's not O-O like in school. I know, right? Let's figure it out. All right, again, I would have this under a stock camera. I'm two, for, I'm two for two. Let's look at the word stew. This isn't going to work as well, but you'll get the gist. Huh, what is surprising here? Think about the word stew. What two letters come together to make that ooh sound? Is it OO like in school? Absolutely not. It is EW because oftentimes when you hear ooh at the end of a word, it is represented by EW. Whoa, this would go up on our chart. Okay, so what's interesting is how many, how many letters are in the word? Four. How many sounds are in the word? Three. Two. Three. Well, three. technically three, right? Let's let's do a slow check. <laughs> Don't worry, she's gonna be in my intervention group. Okay. And then you have to get the, you know, do it on your arm. Yes, exactly. We could. We could chop it up. We yes. Yeah. Um, all right, and then I would do the same thing with blue, right? It would be B L U E. Oh my gosh, what's surprising here? What's a little different? Okay. So guess what, word wizards? We need to know that when we hear the oo sound, it could be spelled E-W, oftentimes at the end of a word like in stew, our keyword here, or U-E, oh, good luck, also at the end of the word. We might have to study more words to see which vowel team is more prevalent in words. Don't worry, that just is fancy for how often it happens. Okay, sorry, it's hard for me to get away from my kid friendly world. Okay, so then we would have a little decodable text, right? So we would start reading this together and then each pair or each group of friends would have a copy to continue on their own. The teacher would move around throughout the classroom, seeing students read, identify the words with the U sound. Are they spelled by UE? Are they spelled by EW? And then there would also be an opportunity for kids to do some writing of these words, right? Because we want to be able to decode them and be able to encode them. Um, and then, of course, maybe they would go off into their own books and be on the lookout for words with our new vowel teams. So there's a little flavor of phonics. It's very explicit. Um, there's lots of opportunities for reading the words, writing the words, and so on. Much more engaging than my phonics workbook when I was in you Same. Know, mm. first grade. Same. And other phonics programs I personally have taught multiple times. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Okay. A little taste of reading. Okay, so first grade is going to be embarking upon a unit called Readers Have Big Jobs to Do. What's great about the new reading units of study, I'm just looking for my little bit of speech, yes, 
is that there are more decoding lessons, um, explicit decoding lessons, in the reading units of study, and I'm gonna get into kind of some of the differences. So for example, what I'm about to show you as a reading lesson is not gonna look radically different than what I just modeled for you as a um, phonics lesson. Okay, readers, we're learning to read you know, longer books, There's gonna, we're gonna be encountering longer, trickier words, and one sound that it is going to be showing up a lot in the words that we read is ow, like in cloud. Hey, we've been studying vowel teams and phonics, right? So there's, again, there's like a big story arc between phonics and reading and actually writing as well. And so we'd say, okay, so OU together makes the ow sound like in cloud. Now technically OU makes five different sounds, but we think about the most high leverage, high utility um, opportunities to study a vowel team. So I'm gonna pick OU like in cloud as opposed to OU as in one of the other sounds, right? Because this is the one that's going to show up most frequently in books that students are reading at this like span of levels. So I'm gonna say, okay, so say kind of a same thing. I have some letters here. I won't make you go through it again. We're gonna build words like ground, like sprout. Um, give kids an opportunity to decode those words. And then, again, there's a little bit of a decodable text here that kids would have. Okay, well let's see, now that we've studied it in isolation, you know, by itself, and we know that OU most oftentimes says the ow sound like in cloud, let's see if we can read this. This is actually an article that we can learn about. It's a nonfiction article about cats and be on the lookout for some ow sounds. So again, we might start reading it together, then they might start reading it with a partner, and then I'm gonna send them off to read at their seats. They're gonna be on the lookout for some words with OU you, maybe you'll find words that don't make the ow sound like in cloud. Whew, we better be on the lookout because it does make five different sounds. They would go ahead and read. As a teacher, I would be pulling some small groups based on my data, right? Because not all kids are going to need a reinforcement of this. Some people are going to be working on comprehension. Some people are going to be working on fluency. Some people are going to need other particular um, decoding type work. And then I might also confer with kids one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to have another whole class teaching opportunity throughout the workshop. And then we'll come together at the end for a share where students will um, show maybe words that they found in their own independent reading books featuring that OU vowel team. Maybe especially if there are rule breakers we might study those together. Not really rule breakers but if they've identified words with other sounds that OU could make. Um, that of course would be great as well. And then throughout that lesson there are multiple opportunities for um, you know, ongoing formative data collection, right? So I'm listening in as kids are reading the article. I'm pulling groups, right, and seeing, you know, getting more data on what they might need. Might be related to this, might be related to something else. And then at the share at the end, if they're reading words or writing words, again, I'm walking around taking notes. Oh, Maria's gonna be in my group tomorrow. Oh, Dr. Smith over there is fine. I don't need to worry about him on this. Things like that. I like, I appreciate the chuckle band. <laughs> Okay. Can you remind us how long one of these lessons might be? Yes, absolutely. Great question. So a typical reading workshop could be anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Generally in first and second grade. In kindergarten, it's more like 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and phonics, generally, across all three grades, is 20 minutes. And is there a sequence of sounds that you start with? And yes. Because the here, you know, young learners can't hear all this, the short sounds? Well. Yes. So there must be a sequence of sound, sequence of letters. Absolutely. Sounds. Yep, there's a scope and sequence across the entire year. Um, great questions. Okay, so some of the shifts. Karen uh, mentioned that we've been studying the Shifting the Balance book. So one big shift is the use of decodable books. I brought some. You're happy to peruse them if you wish. I also have some trade books. So trade book is simply a non-decodable book, like any other like regular, typical, um, level type text. Um, so it's awesome that we've been able to purchase some. Um, and as we talked about in our curriculum, or not curriculum review, our data review today for the kindergarten team, and group that we've seen lots of great teaching um, and evidence of great work happening with these decodable books and trade books because both have a purpose. So that's definitely one of the big shifts that we're doing across all three grades. I'm leaving out pre-K on this one, Kathy. Um, <laughs> using decodable books. We're using them in our whole class teaching in addition to non-decodable books or trade books. Um, we're also using them in small groups and it just kind of depends on what we're doing. So if anyone's interested, might not be the time or the place. 
Um, you're welcome to borrow some insurance. <laughs> and then another thing to keep in mind is um, decoding, right? So you might have heard a little bit about MSV, a little scandalous, so interesting. Um, we used to think about, okay, what would make sense, what would sound right, what would look right? For the last few years, actually, we haven't been doing that. Now our first go-to prompt is like, does it look right? Look at the letters, make the sounds, slide them together, does it look right? So if I'm saying cat and the word is shark, that's an issue, right? So I want to make sure that we're attending to the print in front of us. And then we might cross check or kind of prove like, yes, it's cat because I know it's cat because the sounds like these letters make those sounds. And this is a story about, you know, Tom and Jerry. So it would make sense that the word is cat, right? So we're looking at the letters first. We're relying on our visual processing, attending to the print decoding. And then I can also further prove it because it makes sense and because it sounds right. And when I say, does it sounds right? Sounds right. I mean like syntactically and grammatically. Right, is that how an adult would sound, how a book would sound, is what we say to the kids. Um, and then high frequency word instruction, there's also a bit of a shift in. Um, Dr. Chuck Smith was talking about mapping, right? Like it's important for the brain to be able to map sounds to the graphemes or to the letters. So when we're thinking about high frequency words, words that show up the most often in books, we have kind of a new process. And thinking about Hegarty, we chop up the sounds. And like you were saying, like, yes, you can stretch it on your arm. Like, there's a myriad of ways to do this, right? But Hegarty says, like, we chop the sounds. So if I have a new snap word, because we want kids to read it in a snap and write it in a snap, ultimately it's a high frequency word, I might say, like, OK, I'm not going to show you the word yet, because I'm going to start off doing it auditorily. So, Let's listen to the word and chop up the sounds. I want to teach you the word said. I said, don't do that, right? So let's chop up the sounds we hear. S, e, d. Notice how I'm doing it backwards for me so that it's left to right for you, right? S, e, d. Okay. Hmm. You might be surprised to find out what sounds there are. What sounds do you think there are? Let's tell your partner. Great. You've done that. Awesome. Whew. Let's see. Now we're going to orthographically map that, meaning we're going to map the letters to the sounds. What do you expect to see in the beginning? Yes, you guys are so proficient. Okay, what do you expect to see here? S eh, eh, eh. I hear eh, like Eskimo. Well, the kids are of course going to say, it's E, it's a short E sound. <gasps> Is that surprising? Yes. Wait a minute, AI, we think of this as a vowel team. Well, not really if we're probably learning set for the first time, but still, right? That's surprising, it's unexpected. Whoa, that's a hard part. Maybe we'll even put a heart around it and try and remember it by heart because that part is super tricky. And then what do we hear at the end? Okay, so this is actually how you spell the word said. We heard three sounds. But again, there's more than three letters, right? Super tricky. And there's lots of research um, and evidence that shows that like mnemonics and music can often um, help as well. So we might even like put a little jing a rhyme to it, like S-A-I-D, right? Or something like that. Um, it's because again, we want them to map the letter to the sound so that then when they're like, oh yeah, it sounds like eh, but it's not going to be that expected letter. And we go through that whole process and there's a little bit more to it um, to help kids to kind of own and command those high frequency words on the again decoding side and the encoding side. Doing on time. I've been trying to be very brisk and text and yes. with you this time. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, another shift is making sure that kids have access to a variety of books in their book baggies, which has oh well that's not a shift because they've always had access to a variety of books, but making sure that the types of books they have might be a little different. So for example, they might have some decodable texts. They might have some trade books or just some, you know, a leveled good old standard book. Not that this isn't good, I shouldn't say that because it's great. Um, and then they also might have very high interest books that they are on not able to read at all, right? But they might be reading the pictures or they might know a lot of topic if it's a nonfiction topic that they have a wealth of knowledge on, right? So making sure that they have access to lots of different kinds of books and informing the kids and the parents that there are different purposes for different books, right? So it's not always going to be a book you can read super proficiently and with ease. There might be things that you're working on through different lenses in the variety of books that you have. And then writing 
I didn't bring any tools for that because I knew I'd be running out of time. But writing kind of follows that same structure. We're in first and second grade, it's anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes. Kindergarten, again, maybe like 30 to 40. By the end of the year, there's a quick focus lesson in the beginning. There's some independent work time where the teacher is, again, pulling groups based on data, doing some individual conferences, bring it back together, maybe highlight and showcase you know, what the students did. Maybe I need to lift the level. Maybe I need to provide more guided practice if I feel like the target wasn't met. So just a super quick example, first grade is um, launching an opinion writing unit, right? Like our earliest um, access to argument and essay writing. So they have to have an opinion and then a few reasons though, right? Like idea, right? Claim. Oh, I need my middle people for that. And then some supporting uh, evidence there. So they might say, like, Ben and Jerry's is the best ice cream. That's my opinion. Now, what are my reasons? I need three reasons. And then, of course, teachers are going to teach, like, elaboration strategies and everything else. And then we might craft one together. They're going to write their own. Again, the teacher is pulling small groups and individual conferences based on data. And that is just a teeny tiny taste of how some of these lessons look. I would certainly invite you to come see some of it in action. I'm not going to request that my classroom teachers do it necessarily, unless they're willing, but I can certainly model for you. And then you can see me coaching into it as well. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, it's going to take me a moment to collect all my props. <laughs> I have to say, with the kindergartner at home, I feel like uh, I'm living this. <laughs> So if you think back to that circle pie chart with the four parts, Rosemary just gave you a taste of each of those four parts and you can see how they all work together and integrate the learning and why we're seeing such transfer across. Um, I will be really brisk <laughs> um, as I describe what happens at Cider Mill. Um, I can do that very concisely. Our intermediate level students have three periods of their day devoted to literacy. The first of these is about an hour for reading, during which time they engage in a whole class demonstration or read aloud. Um, then they move to independent reading time where students apply the repertoire of strategies they're learning in the current unit of instruction as their teacher delivers small group instruction. And then they go back to the whole class for a share where exemplary work or an extension can be showcased. Our intermediate students also have a 40 minute writing class that follows a similar whole class, small group, whole class structure. Um, to reading, but in the small groups, in the small portion, um, it's independent writing rather than reading as the backdrop for the small group instruction. And finally, our intermediate students engage in the word study component of the comprehensive literacy framework for about 20 minutes a day, which utilizes the Words Their Way program for vocabulary, spelling, and phonics. At Middlebrook, the new schedule will also allow us to consistently deliver instruction in reading, writing, and word work that provides substantial time for students to orchestrate skills and strategies they are using within the units of study while receiving tailored, differentiated instruction to meet their needs where they are at the same time growing them to grade level standards or beyond. Not nearly as entertaining as Rosemary. <laughs> For this section, we'll take a peek at how our students are doing. Um, at NWEA's research division, specifically the Center for Schools in Progress, published a brief this month entitled Progress Toward Pandemic Recovery, Continued Signs of Rebounding Achievement at the Start of the 2022-23 School Year. I want to start this section by sharing their key findings with you as they mirror what we are seeing in our data here in Wilton. The NWA reports that students lost less ground over the summer of 2022 compared to pre-pandemic trends. We came back in the fall with our fall um, achievement and reported that we had not seen a summer slide in most grades. At second, academic rebounding in reading and math continued in the fall of 2022. However, that rebounding is not even across school years and summers, especially in reading. Third, the youngest students in the sample, current third graders who were kindergartners when the pandemic began, have the largest reading achievement gap and showed the least rebounding nationwide. Um, when we returned from lockdown, I mentioned our that year's third grade as a cohort of concern, and I'm, I'm still following them a little bit closely because I don't think it's, it, for us, it's our fourth graders that are not rebounding as quickly. Our third graders are actually showing a nice um, recovery. 
And fourth, NWEA found that even with continued rebounding, student achievement nationwide remains lower than in a typical year, and full recovery is likely still several years away. Oh, no, stay there. Sorry. Um, one bright spot that I mentioned earlier that bears repeating, 99% of our third graders began the school year with their phonemic awareness secured. Um, Rosemary did a beautiful job showing you, um, showing you phonemic awareness, so we're just going to move forward. Let's see if I can pick up where we are. This slide actually um, generates more questions for me than it answers. And I, that, that's why I wanted to share the NWA data, data with you. We're being asked to give the state our achievement data during a time when our um, learning has not been typical. So you see a lot of ups and downs here. I would like to report though, and I want to make sure I get these numbers correct for you. I've lost my place somewhere in here. I'll find it. In kindergarten, just um, last month, December 13th, our kindergartners, 74% of our kindergartners um, were at benchmark or higher in the area of foundational skills. Yes! <laughs> it's big. It so, really is. And that was also their first experience taking the test, correct? We will, you know, dive into this. In the workshops and these. So you like the questions? Of what? Um, rolling. Just roll. Oh, just yeah. Rolling. Yeah. Rolling. So yeah. Which how much? But this should be. Yeah. So because we want them in before the workshops, right? If you, as you, so I would say, um, as you, as, as whatever you're able to generate, um, it'll just help us prepare for the workshops. Um, but I mean, we, it's a lot of information and it's an iterative process. Um, so the best you're able. Yeah. And we should send the questions to you first, Ruth, so you can. Um, I think it would be helpful if you send them to me and then. Um, I'll make sure they get to Kevin, and he'll make sure that we all receive um, the answers. Yeah. And as Kevin spoke earlier, um, the questions that we receive and then the answers are put um, out on the website for um, for the public to be able to um, see and learn from. At whenever any I'm invited in my statement at any time at any point, um, people should be feel free to reach out um, to the board of ed. Um, our website has our email address. It's boe at wiltonps.org, and um, please um, comments questions are all welcome. Look at those beautiful faces. Right? They're the best looking kids in Connecticut. They're the smartest. They're amazing. <laughs> Worth every penny. I don't think anyone ever questions that. Yes. yes. I know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, we have one other um, item on the agenda. Um, Review and discuss um, Board of Education Bylaw 9120 election of officers. Um, you know, Jen, you had made a proposal, and um, I have it here. Anybody wants? Just, oh, sorry. You wanted um, to read it? Yeah, to explain your proposal and um, why um, you're requesting it. Um, so, my proposal was prior to nominations being solicited or made, any board member wishing to hold an officer position will have three to five minutes mm -hmm. to provide to the full board a statement of interest in a particular position. If a board member is not elected to a position for which he or she asks to be considered, that member may be nominated for another officer position. I think it's no surprise. I think we've kind of talked about this in the past. Um, I don't think that our board of 
Education Officer election is a very open or transparent process, and I would like to move past that. <laughs> Officers who don't win can certainly be nominated for already. The only thing that changes is that people who want to run for a position, yeah. we have a conversation about it, what, yes, which is different than nominated. what currently happens. Yes, instead of just nominated you. Right now, right now, people just randomly nominate other people, and discussions happen. So, is elsewhere. there something? I'm just because I came in after this, and I was on the board in the past where there were contests between for the chair um, and so I, my question is do you is there something where you that the board feels that there is an opportunity for someone who's interested in position to express his or her interest in it okay I you know and just this was before my first um, I always laugh because my first Bed meeting and the floor, you know, there were three of us who were brand new to the board. There was a contest for the chair, and it was two of us newbies who had to nominate. And you know, so through the course of the fall, there were conversations, and they weren't, you know, they were one on one. There was no, it wasn't seen as a campaign, it was just more that, you know, each of the per, each person was like, I want to be chair, you know, and then they reached out to the appropriate person, asked, Will you? nominate me at the meeting um, and you know my thought at the time was you know, it's always good to have multiple people running for things I think once a person's in the position but this was somewhere where the it was someone challenging the sitting chair um, and you know I thought that was good I mean you know no one should be assumed they're gonna keep their position um, and then, you know, I've never heard me ask, like, why do you want to be chair? Because um, I'm always like, why would you want to be chair? But, you know. Um, oh. I think that it is a... Are you saying that someone has to give a statement if they want to be the chair? I think, yeah. I think people should. I think that if you want to run for a position and be in a chair or a vice chair or a second, you should say, hey, I would like to hold this position and this is why. I feel like if you don't say that and somebody wants to nominate you, fine. But you should, I mean, everybody should have an opportunity to say, hey, I would like this position and this is why. I just, I mean, to some extent, I think being nominated or accepting your nomination kind of shows your interest. Your interest. And the duties and responsibilities of each officer are enumerated in the bylaws. And there's no, you know, movement around that. So it's kind of like you're willing to do the work that everybody knows what the work is. I just think that there's nothing currently in our bylaws that if somebody wants to say I'm interested or I would like to be nominated or would like to express their interest or why that prevents it. I'm just not sure that it's a necessary um, requirement. That's okay to think about it. Last year when we had elections I abstained. Nobody ever asked me why. This year, I have stayed from the entire thing. Nobody's ever asked me why. Well, it's a secret ballot. It's not no, a secret not. ballot. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not secret. They're public. I mean, it's a paper well, ballot. Well, it's a, it's a, paper, it's a paper, paper ballot, but your name, but those those names aren't made public. The recorded yeah, they are. Oh, they are. Mm -hmm. They all are. I, my point is just. Everybody has their own opinion, that is totally fine. But if we truly want to be an open, transparent, and honest group of people and have an honest conversation about stuff, I don't know why people would oppose to the suggestion. I guess I'm just not quite sure why, the, how the current, the current setup is not honest or transparent. So, 
because I wasn't involved, I'm curious about if there was someone else who was interested in the position that it was all she. So she was not nominated for, you know, and what was going on with the board that that person didn't feel comfortable. As I said, like, you know, I had never met Gil Breyer, which like, the, like, you know, one of the first conversations I had with each of them was that he wanted to be chair. Does that make sense? And I had, didn't know them. Like, I was a new, you know, we were coming to the board as new members, and, you know, but you all have been on the board together. So my question is, like, was there someone who wanted to be vice chair who didn't feel like she could express that or talk to someone else and say, will you nominate me? Does that make sense? I mean, I'm just curious because I, you know, wasn't here. And so I wasn't, and th to be honest, it just never occurred to me that things won't keep the way they were, right. you know? And I know that we were, you know, once Bruce was in chair, like we just kind of did, I think we probably set this precedent of like we just kept reelecting whoever, you know, as long as Gar Gilbray and Karen Burke were at the table, they were the other officers because they were the senior people. And so there, Bruce was chair with two officers who had been chairs in the past. Um, you know, and before that, there were obviously contentious um, officer elections. At, you know, I think every board has suffered that. The Board of Ed just kind of has bumped along. And, you know, as an app, like when I was off the board, I just assumed it was like everyone who was interested in a job or a position had expressed him or herself. And so I think it's important, like it's telling that, Jen, that you feel like, first of all, Standing for an office, like voting for an officer is pretty serious, right? And you must have felt really strongly. And I think it's a concerning that the board did that. You know, it says something about the board and the relationships on the board. And you don't have to be best friends off the board, but um, you know, it's upsetting to think that you felt that you could, or anyone didn't felt like. I don't mean to keep looking. Jen's right across from me, well, so I apologize. I, 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 I keep staring at you, Jen. I nominated Jen. Yeah. I'm thinking that she would be good. But you had never asked Jen but if she I wanted to be nominated? She, no, I didn't. Okay. Or Jen didn't ask. Jen, did you? No. Like, we never had a conversation because okay. for some reason I don't feel like we can, we're can. allowed to talk to each other. Okay. No, yeah, but you are. But we are. Yeah, but we are. Yeah, yeah, but we are. I, I know, but there was the, the parameters were a little tricky, so I just felt okay. like she right. would be good at it. She right. had a good head. She's been on the board. She has good questions. She cares. She's committed. Oh, I'm not questioning. Yeah, but I, so that's who, why who I was chosen to be on the board. Never asked her. So I think that's interesting yeah, because, I as agree. I said, when Karen and Gil went off the board, obviously we all discussed like who should take over for them. Yeah. Um, but again, it was like the one-on-one. -on -one, like we didn't have a board discussion. I don't think it occurred to yeah. us. Um, and we didn't do anything illegal because it was just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like, Laura, would you be interested in doing this or so and so? You know. Um, Can you I know, make a recommendation? You were never yeah. cold. I think. What? So just, I mean, the I think the. The bylaw change is one way to go. Another opportunity could be in looking at the um, maybe the couple of November board meetings leading into the general uh, the the annual meeting in December. Um, maybe we add an agenda item to one of those things. It's just a discussion of officers, and that I think it puts it on the table for you. Right. I mean, that conversation can be structured any way you want, but at least yeah. the first question might be: Is anyone interested in yeah. running for chair? Yeah. And you know, if the current chair would have an opportunity to say yes or no. I, yeah. Yeah. I assume that it's like I nominated Pam, and Pam's like, I don't want to do it. I mean, you can turn down the nomination. You can turn down the nomination. Okay. okay. Yes. You yeah. Can, yeah. So that's why I just think that yeah. this. I don't think the bylaw, as it's currently written, is what's hindering. No, it's a conversation. Perfectly honest, I don't care what we change as long as something changes. <laughs> so, I don't care how you word it, but moving forward, I would love for their... Like well, let's just... Meeting. So we understand the purpose and what's trying to be achieved, so let's just... If it's you guys asked put it to... Proposal, no, so I, no yes. there's nothing wrong with no, that. I, no, I know. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah, no, the proposal like, gets the conversation um, going. So um, we will put this on... Um, Wait, before yes. we do this, because I'm just looking like this year it would have been fine to have the last meeting in November discuss it because you were all going to be on December right. first. Um, but this coming this up changes. year, yes. your last meeting in November, there's potentially four of you who won't be right. on the board. So that's not an appropriate time to have yeah. the conversation. Right. And, um, you know, 
you know, bring out to the election to do orientation for the new members and to have them understand. And there's nothing on any of our town boards that says you can't, a new member can't become chair or vice chair or secretary. Um, so that, I'm just throwing right. No, I mean, no, that's so. I, so I think, think that what we should then do is put this to the policy committee and have them look at the date of the organ or the organizational committee. I mean, the organizational meeting, because if it's that first weekend in December, if that then conflicts with new members might be coming on to the board, we can just look at the entire the entire. Yeah. Um, System. Or it becomes part of the organizational meeting. Or it can become part of the organizational meeting. Well, that, yeah, yes, that or however, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, but my only suggestion would be not to wait until the organizational meeting to have a conversation about what people were interested in or what they wanted to do. Because to be honest, by that point, the decisions have already been made. But they shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> but I'm but they you have. I know, that's, but I'm also trying to that's get the two, like, yeah. you know, there's right. no one who can force anyone. Yeah, you, there's no, your vote or, is your own vote. And that, I think that's yeah. important that if you, people feel that way, like they're, they don't have a voice and there isn't an option or there isn't a discussion, um, that's a problem. Um, you know, and I don't know because it means we don't. You don't have officers if you wait an extra. Like if you do the first meeting in December to discuss it and then vote, there's no nobody in charge. Like the officers yeah. don't exist for that first meeting. Yeah. That's why it was the way it was. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying it's just. And I'm back to. I'm going back to. And these were the days where you know there was no contest, right? Like. The Republicans ran two people, the Dems ran one, and we all just went on the board. And so um, it was kind of, you know, you know they, so we talked, you know, everyone knew who was going to be on the board. You know, it's exciting that we're not in contests and that, that, you know, it's not guaranteed. I know it's pain, and, excuse me, kind of pain for all of you that you have to campaign. <laughs> um, but it makes it different. And it, you know, maybe it's time to make some changes. To rethink something, and, you know. Obviously, um, I don't mean to go on about but um, <laughs> there were some bad old days too, you know. But it's concerning because the board of it, you know, none of you should feel that way. Um. So, is there agreement amongst the table that we'll put this to the policy committee to um, to look at and? Um, come up with something that reflects the discussion and then it'll come back to the table through the regular um, course of a bylaw discussion change. And then we should probably look at the calendar because we can't next year's going to be tricky because four people are coming. Well, that's something the policy should, should talk about. Yes, that's exactly, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, yes. I'm looking at the policy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think maybe there should be multiple, like instead of just then the policy committee saying here it is to review and discuss, there should be some just like a yeah. couple opportunities to yeah. discuss it so the people who aren't on the policy committee can give some feedback yeah. and how they feel. Yeah. Yes. People are also elected to the there is time that they can right, but they're not sworn in. They're not sworn in. The conundrum is the first meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we'll yeah. just have to. <laughs> and the same yeah. background, the yeah. No, definitely. I mean, you know. Yeah. And just. Yeah. So we'll look at the. We'll look at it. So maybe it's worth talking. To. Good yes. Saying, that will, like, what do we do in that, in that interim period? What is what's permissible? What's yeah. not? Yeah. Yes. So we will um, look it's at it. Be covered in orientation. Yeah. Okay. We are um, comments from the public. Lucille, is there anyone online to comment? No, I think we lost the internet connection. Okay. My presentation broke Zoom. Then um, I call Brutal. this meeting adjourned at 9 20. <laughs> <laughs>
that is their first so, experience taking the test. Think about that. Um, right. It was it was evident in the data set as a whole that these learners had not experienced our uh, mitigation strategies when they were in full effect. That they were more typical learners. So I'm very excited to follow their growth to see the traction in our curricular decisions. Our first graders, 70 percent of our first graders have their foundational skills at benchmark or higher, and in second grade that number is 72 percent. So I'm thrilled with our. Um, K2, both our rebounding as well as starting to see um, some progress with our learning there. That's, so we'll talk a little bit about next steps here. Um, go ahead and move. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I mentioned before that we're going to evaluate programs. We received the first of those materials in December. Um, we're, we'll put together a team of um, expert teachers to pull, pull those apart. We follow a six-pronged process when we evaluate programs and instructional resources, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We'll engage in the waiver process late next month, and we'll make a decision in time for the budget of 2024 and 2025. As we evaluate programs, I am going to need my notes for this one. We evaluate in six areas. The first of those is need. We use multiple data sources and disaggreg disaggregated data to understand our needs and our assets. We assess the evidence. We look at outcomes of um, other, where, where the program was used in other places. We look at fidelity and we look at cost effectiveness. We examine fit by studying the fit with our community values, culture, and history, and we consider the impact on other initiatives, such as adopting a new math program on the same timeline, and we examine alignment with these other priorities. We look at usability, where we ask if the program is well-defined, and we determine possible adaptations for context and for our populations. We examine capacity, where we consider the costs of implementation and the resources, like professional learning and coaching, that are available for implementation. And finally, we examine supports, where we look at what expert assistance can be provided and examine external resources for implementing sites. And finally, um, so as you can see, we engage in a thorough analysis and an effort to minimize dips in achievement as a result of implementing something new, whether it be curriculum, a program, or in this case, um, this year, a set of instructional resources. This, slides comes, this slide comes from the concerns-based adoption model and shows the progression of a new initiative as it is rolled out. It's a human endeavor that we're engaged in. Um, it's not as easy as handing a box of resources to a teacher, have the teacher open the box, and expect that that be taught um, in an effective manner. So you see at the bottom that this um, level of use starts with non-use, and it progresses up to renewal, where the user is you'd be more look, seeking more, alter, more effective excuse me, more effective ways of implementing the program. Um, my concern here is that for right now, we're currently on stage four of implementing um, TC reading units of study and level six and seven for many of our teachers with regard to the phonics units of study. So they are engaged anywhere from routine implementation to refined implementation and really integrated implementation. Um, Moving to any new program will set us back at least to level two preparation where we have definite plans to begin to use the innovation, um, but we'll have some teachers that are stuck in non-use um, to start with, and I do have concerns about how that will impact the progress we are currently making. Um, to teachers are refining their learning and their practice with existing programs and we are seeing traction in the data. As we evaluate resources and study students who aren't responding favorably to our tier one programming, we will refine that programming to buoy all students and bolster their learning to, um, so that all of our students in, um, experience reading success. Okay, thanks. Anybody have any questions or comments? The waiver lasts for how long? Is it a one-year waiver? 
Okay. If they approve it, I'm assuming that it's we're good. Yeah, because I can't okay. imagine having to reevaluate re programs annually. And just to, to summarize, right, the intent of the legislation, because there is a reading problem in the state of Connecticut, is you highlighted um, a lot of the issues we see are in alliance districts. But the intent of the legislation was to address the foundational reading skills for all kids. What Rosemary presented, what you shared, the data you shared suggests that the changes we've made to our curriculum are in fact addressing very discreetly those foundational skills and we're seeing lots of success. That's the punchline here. That's the punchline. Yeah. And I would just add to that, we're not confident in those mechanisms. Of course. That they will do any better and may in fact do worse than what we're already doing. Do you guys have numbers for for children identified? It's really hard right now. Um, when we were on the committee and the in ELA committee, um, and the implementation of the Hegarty and the implementation of some of that work, and then the pandemic struck. So I'm I'm really hesitant. We were beginning to be what I would have termed cautiously optimistic about what we were seeing with the implementation of the phonemic and phonological awareness work. Um, and its impact on students who um, who had kind of unexpected underachievement in reading by grade three, um, and much of that centered around grade three having to go back and do phonemic and phonological awareness work. They came in with deficits in phonemic and phonological awareness. Some of those kids responded to that intervention and never ended up being referred to special education. Some of the students did not, right? As you would expect in the, in a process of, of you know, looking at a response to intervention, SRBI kind of model. What's challenging right now to make grand pronouncements about the data is the overlay of the pandemic and what happened particularly to our youngest learners who had a substandard preschool experience coming to K-1-2 having to, those K-1-2 teachers having to kind of backtrack and teach some of the of the skills that are typically taught in preschool. So it's, it's hard, hard to make really grand pronouncements. We were and continue to be optimistic with the impact of the phonemic and phonological awareness work. We haven't yet seen the decrease in referrals to special education, but again, I'm not sure that's related to a curriculum issue as much as it's related to post-pandemic learning recovery issues. So it, it's really hard to pull them apart at this point, but now that we're back in to a more, you know, our accelerated learning model is well in play and the kids are moving forward. I think over the next 18 months to a year, I'll be more confident and I think we'll all be more confident in understanding the impact of the curricular change versus any residual pandemic problems. Does that make sense? It's just not easy to parse out right now because of the pandemic uh, and all that happened as a result and all that we're still seeing. I would like to say that. I would love to say that. I just don't want to, um, you know, it's hard. We were really excited about what we were starting to see. And then the pandemic hit, and it knocked everything a little bit around. Um, so I don't want that to color this issue. Yeah. We had preschoolers, yeah. you had kindergartners that never had never been to preschool. Ever. Right. So we had first graders who watched instruction on a video and yeah. did not engage with right. the teacher who was monitoring their progress. So that's yeah. a huge for half of yeah. a year yeah. while they were key and key learning in first grade about vowel teens. 
And that's to, you know, the, the K2 teachers during that time did extraordinary work. It was just extraordinary work in extraordinary circumstances. And now they're getting back to a full implementation of a curriculum. So we'll be, I think we'll be able to assess it more finely. Like 18 months, a year to 18 months from now, and then I'd like to be able to stand here and, you know, with my pom poms, and, you know, be very excited. Right. About the so, so next year's meetings, we'll talk about lower, not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing lower in this meeting tonight. <laughs> um, my only other question, and if it can be answered now, great. And if you want to give me an answer later on, that's totally fine. Um, our connection to TC at each of our schools and the costs associated with it. Um, maybe what that current cost is and what future. future sure, and we can do that during the budget be. meetings if that's, that's okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. policies to review yes all right so we'll move through these quickly um, as you know we um, through the policy committee we've continued just a systematic review and updating of the policy manuals um, so the there's a set on here tonight that the committee has reviewed and I'll just I'll walk you through very briefly um, what the changes are or the recommendations are, if any. Um, so the first policy, 6171.3, the placement of special education students. Um, we've reviewed that policy, as I said, just as part of our um, systematic update. There are no substantive changes being proposed. Um, I did catch, I, we're missing the word information in the last sentence, so I did um, add a word that doesn't appear in the, um, in the version you have, um, but I did add a word just to complete the sentence because it was omitted. I'm going to take and read it for you. So the last sentence will read, the superintendent shall provide the Board of Education with information on the number of students placed outside the district on a monthly attendance report, um, just so it reads cleanly. But again, nothing substantive there. Um, so we can just check that box um, and move on. The next policy the committee reviewed, uh, 4118.234, was the um, prohibition of psychotropic drugs. Um, again, just some you know technical word changes on this. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if there are any technical word changes. Um, we confirmed the statutory obligation here, um, but we're not recommending any changes to this policy. Next one is um, policy 4113.1, Instructional Arrangements, Workload, and Responsibility. Um, this is a policy um, that uh, is dated. Um, it contains sentiments that are duplicated in other policies. Um, instructional arrangements are covered by collective bargaining agreements. It's not a required policy, and so the recommendation is that we retire it. So here's, here's what's getting smaller tonight, our policy manual, perhaps. <laughs> Got a few of those. Um, so that's the recommendation is to retire that policy. Um, Similarly, the next one, 6145.21, the Sunday activities policy. Um, it, it, it's a very you know well-established practice that we avoid Sundays for uh, most of our activities. Um, again, here too, this is a dated policy. It's not a required policy. And so the committee recommendation is that this policy also be retired. Moving right along. Um, 5141.31, the physical examinations policy. Here. Um, this policy um, is duplicative. Um, the policy is covered by our health assessment, the policy language is covered by our health assessments policy. And so um, there's, there's really no need for this. So we're recommending that we retire this policy also. Um, and then the last is um, policy 6165, student production of goods and services. Um, if you're detecting a theme here, um, this is an old and obsolete policy. Um, again, no mandate to carry it out. Um, so we're recommending that we retire that policy as well. Um, 
so if there is um, are there any questions on the recommendations um let's see if i can put this all in one motion can i have a motion to approve the technical changes to 6171.3 and 4118.234, and to retire 4113.1, I'm sorry to interrupt. Of course. First, we need to amend the agenda to move the review and discuss to action. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a problem. You're correct. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so is so there I move that we is, the agenda to take all the policies that have been just mentioned and place them under action items? Under action items. Is there a second for that motion? Yes. All in favor? Um, Aye. Right. Now, after I read all those numbers. I'm teasing. You are correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, is there a motion to? Um, to make technical changes to 61713 and 4118.234 and then retire um, the policy on instructional arrangements, Sunday activities, physical examinations, student production of goods and services, and student production of goods and services. Is there a second? second. Nicola, thank you. All in favor? Well, all you great. Um, so tonight I'm presenting an initial proposal for the fiscal uh, 24 education budget. I say initial because, as you'll see shortly, the budget proposal represents an increase that's far greater than any budget I've presented in my decade serving as a superintendent of schools. Um, before we get into that, this budget wasn't born on my desk, and as always when we do these things, there's just a great number of people to recognize for their diligent and thoughtful efforts in preparing the proposal. So all of the administrators in the room tonight, um, Eric Hawkinson, who's at home, their ILs in each of the buildings, um, you know, scores of you know teacher representatives, uh, Don Norton, who's here, um, Marianne Salvada, who I'm sure is online um, watching. She functions as our. Um, essentially is our budget director um, and of course you know all the folks who participate along the way in the budget conversations we have um, all of that information all of that work really led to um, this proposal such as it is um, and then you know last and you know not least um, Lucille DeNovio um, who is my right and left hand um, has been uh, exceptionally busy putting together this slide deck um, and you'll see her fingerprints are all over it um, so what you're going to hear tonight is really a high-level summary um, with some discussion of the major drivers and the differences year over year in budgets. Um, we'll rely on the workshops that are scheduled for um, the week after next to do a deep examination as we have of the various cost centers. And then um, we'll also continue our practice of collecting and responding to your questions in writing. I think that's a process we've established some years ago and is effective for just building building out our, our record. So this year, um, we are confronting a set of variables that combine to create significant upward pressure on our annual operating budget. Um, I'll discuss them in much more detail as we move through this, but um, just you know, to, to summarize, we've settled three contracts this year, and so this year we've experienced extraordinary inflationary pressures, and those are reflected in those contracts. Our health care utilization is higher than it's been in the past. Um, Inflation has impacted both our fixed and our variable costs. The ARP ESSER grants that we've utilized over the last two years um, expire in June. 
the cost of special education outplacements has increased significantly and our numbers of students with special needs is also projected to increase. Substitute shortages across the state um, are being addressed through proposed pay increases, and you'll see that reflected in our budget as well. And then um, you know this already, but we continue to see an increase in the number of students experiencing acute mental health crises. And um, as you just heard in the, um, the, the reading discussion, we continue to deal with COVID recovery. So all of those, and you know, among others, um, impact you know what you're going to see tonight so we'll have um, a little more time to discuss that as we get into this um, but I do want to start on a cheerier note <laughs> if we can um, so it should go without saying that we remain committed to our mission and vision to inspire and prepare all students to contribute meaningfully to a globally interdependent society um, we continue the development and implementation of our portrait of a graduate um, this year has really been fascinating to listen to um, conversations across our school buildings and in various departments about the implementation work. Um, we know if you have a high schooler, um, I have two, um, they are busy through their advisories working on building their portfolios and so thinking about the various attributes of the portrait of the graduate and then looking at their collection of um, educational academic artifacts and trying to match them to those um, various descriptors and build out their portfolios. Um, so this is really, really good work. It's work that's uh, underway across the district and I think it's a um, one example of a, of a hallmark of our, our mission and vision um, being brought to life. Um, generally, when I think about budgets and school budgets, um, to me, school budgets really ought to do two things. They ought to pay for performance and they ought to pay for opportunity. And so uh, this has been an amazing year in terms of um, performance. And so I'd like to just let's take a minute and think about, you know, what our system has accomplished. Um, as you know, and it's definitely worth repeating in the context of this conversation, um, the state of Connecticut recognized Wilton as the top performing school district in the state on its next generation accountability report card. Um, that's a direct reflection of the work of our uh, teachers in the classrooms, our administration, administrative staff, and the, um, the programming decisions that we've made to support intervention, to implement the accelerating acceleration framework, to grow the work of reading, as you just heard tonight. And so we have indicators all across the system um, through just about all of our standardized measures. Um, again, in some of these other, um, you know, kind of more superfluous measures, um, U.S. News and World Report continues to recognize um, the high school as, you know, among the top 1% in the country. Um, niche, for whatever it's worth, continues to recognize um, our school system and our high school as among the top performers here in the state and across the country. And so on the performance front, if you consider the budgetary and investment, um, in my opinion, we are seeing significant return on that investment. Um, on the opportunity front, I think the story is just as rosy. So we have um, scores of students here at our high school that are accessing, participating in, and being successful in college level courses. We had 100 students 70 students over the last year participate in the UConn ECE courses, and we had um, several hundred students participate in AP courses. And so those are among the most rigorous courses we offer in our high school course catalog. And again, our kids participate and do very, very well um, across the um, spectrum of opportunities here in the district. Um, our kids perform exceptionally well. I don't know if you noticed walking in, um, we have several pieces of student artwork on display out here in the media center and I was tempted earlier to bring them in and just have them as a backdrop. Uh, the, um, the students um, participating in fashion design, you can see the dresses that are out there. I, they're, uh, they're incredible. And so again, you go back to what does a budget pay for? It is these kinds of opportunities for kids to really tap into their creativity and develop um, tremendous skills in these areas of interest for them. Um, you know, again, on the 
athletic fields uh, on the stage, you know, in the music ensembles, um, the accolades that our students rack up are impressive. And so, you know, coming back to the context of a budget, um, in terms of performance, in terms of opportunity, um, we are a very, very strong district. So every budget conversation begins with assumptions. Um, some of this is going to get repetitive as I work through some of these slides, so you can just forgive me for that. Um, we expect next year a total enrollment of 3,742 students. Um, as a result of shifting enrollment, um, the budget's going to account for two additional classroom teachers at Cider Mill. Um, as you'll see when we get into the details, these budget assumptions that we laid out earlier this year really have borne out, particularly um, with the um, cost increases. Um, with respect to our priorities and our goals with this budget, um, the budget intends to fund what I think is a really strong system. Um, what, if I had to put this budget in a, in a sentence, um, I would say, the budget essentially is funding what we have today and will provide the um, ongoing support for us to continue our incremental improvement. What you're not going to see in this budget or any carve outs of new programs, new initiatives, targeted spending in any particular new area, um, the budget and the constraints on the budget don't permit that. Um, they haven't for some time and so um, this budget allows us um, to continue to do well what we've been doing well, if that makes sense to you. Um, just another note about what's not in this budget um, on the facilities front. Um, we have talked at length over the years about the ongoing needs at Cider Mill, at Wilton High School, and at Middlebrook. Um, in the town budget, um, Lynn, I understand, is planning to um, fund the cost of a 10-year facilities master plan for um, those three schools as well as for some town facilities. And so um, anticipating that that funding comes through, the plan for our school buildings would be initiated and developed over the course of um, the summer you know, 2023. And then we would use that in um, conversation with our you know, partners here in the town to develop an action plan going forward. And so, you know, really beginning probably in fiscal 25, would we expect to see um, some material proposals coming out of that facilities master plan? Um, what you will see um, with regard to facilities in the various funding lines are just the, the routine maintenance that we um, pick up as part of our annual funding. Okay, so just want to be clear on that piece too. Um, and there is a, you know, you'll get to this later, but there is a proposal to add security cameras. That's a fairly substantial chunk of change, which we'll talk about in due time. Um, so with respect to enrollment, you know, it shouldn't be news to anyone that we've continued to experience an enrollment decline. Um, you know, in this current year, enrollment is actually slightly up from where it was in 21-22. We're projected um, to go down um, by 47 students or so uh, in the next year. And then um, if the projections hold, we'll see, you know, a very slight increase in the following year and then a slight dip in the, in the next year. Um, just forgive this slide. Um, you have, this is a truncated version of a table um, that I've provided to you. I sent a copy to the Board of Finance. I think I sent it to all of you yesterday. Um, we include the detail enrollment history so, um, so you all, so viewers can track just enrollment shifts across the schools. Um, of note, there are a few things I would just highlight for you here. Um, one, we're anticipating an increase in the number of students who are participating in Community Steps, which is our 18 to 21 transition program. Um, I would also note for you the um, projected increase in the number of students with IEPs. You know, this is important because when we talk about um, you know, why the budget is the budget, why our um, personnel request is what it is, and, you know, maybe for some others, why the um, FTE um, doesn't match the enrollment decline. It's because the, the needs of our students have shifted. And so I just, you know, we look again for these indicators, um, and this is just one of those indicators I'd ask you to be... Um, 
to be mindful of. Um, you know, this is just a, a, a note. When you look at this slide, um, you'll see in the blue column there for 22, 23, those numbers actually aren't our actuals. Those are what we built the budget off of enrollment wise. And so those get updated, you know, at the end of the year. And so you'll see a discrepancy when you look at the bottom line of those numbers versus what our current October 1 numbers are. And just, um, just as an FYI. Um, what else about this? Um, I think just again on the enrollment versus um, FTE note, so not only are the needs of our students continuing to change, we um, have more students with more needs. Um, when you go back to the FTE question, um, I just again remind people, you know, we have chosen to invest in programs that improve the overall quality of our services um, and our district. And so two examples of where we've chosen to invest in human infrastructure is our instructional coaching program, which you know we've talked a lot about around this table, and our library media services program and the library media center and um, the staff that are living there are really you know intended to be the heart of a lot of our innovation work. And so you know we built that program out. Um, so a few more details about enrollment. Um, if you look at this slide, you can see um, just again across the district, you know, little change anticipated at Miller Driscoll and at Wilton High School. Um, we're anticipating an increase in enrollment at Cider Mill and a fairly substantial decrease at uh, Middlebrook School. I want to flag kindergarten enrollment for you for a moment. And so note that kindergarten, we're projecting 255 students, not the 224 that was initially proposed by Ellen Esman. When I saw the 224 number in Ellen's um, projections, I, I noted the discrepancy between that and then what my loan and McBroom had proposed for 23 kindergarten a year ago when they did our demographics for us. Um, so I asked them about it. I sent them Ellen's study and I said, can you just, you know, try to come up with an answer for me? And so what we discovered was that um, Ellen based her um, projection for kindergarten on a 200, uh, excuse me, a 2018 birth cohort of 116, but the actual 2018 birth cohort was 134. So the difference is 18 there and our birth to K ratio would typically is two, um, so you double that, and so you get a difference of about 36 kindergarten students. So that's what accounts for the discrepancy. Um, when I spoke to Mike Zuba, the demographer, about this, um, he said, you know, 255 is a solid projection for next year, and so that's the number we're going with. Make sense? Great. All right. So as part of our um, commitment. Um, in this budget um, to the total academic program. Our budget is um, proposing to protect um, current class size averages. So you can see um, at Miller Driscoll, we're anticipating uh, class sizes of somewhere between either 19 and um, 21. At Cider Mill, we're in the same range between 20 and 21. Um, at Middlebrook in the high school, um, on the low end, we're again in the same range um, between uh, 17, 18, depending on the class, and you know maybe in some classes high as 23, 24. But again, um, no dramatic difference in class size averages um, across any of our schools. All right, so here's another agonizing slide for you. Um, you have this already. Um, this is the FTE chart, and as you know, this is another document you got yesterday, um, and we track FTE um, changes by category over time, I think going back to 14-15. Um, um, so here's what I want to say about this. <clears throat> this budget proposal and the accompanying FTE recommendation um, assumes a Middlebrook schedule change. Okay, so when you're looking at that and you look down FTE, um, I'll get into those details, but I just I want to say that at the outset. And so um, there's an accompanying um, reduction of 7.0 FTE. Um, if you want a dollar amount for about seven teachers, I would assume um, about $750,000, so three quarters of a million, uh, just to give you uh, 
an estimate of what that would mean. But the actual potential impact of a schedule change at Middlebrook is actually between 9 and 10 FTE, not 7. Um, we're going to have, um, as Ruth already mentioned, um, a much more detailed discussion of that proposed schedule um, on February 2nd. But I do want to just give you my thoughts since we're you know, talking about FTE changes. Um, to go back a step, we laid out a number of goals for a Middlebrook schedule change. And we also, we know no schedule is perfect, but of all the iterations that Jory and his team looked at, the block schedule proposal addressed most of the goals. So we can address the math curriculum. Um, Trudy has shared with you already that illustrative math provides a model for a block schedule. Um, as part of this, we can reintegrate the data and statistics um, portion of the curriculum back into the core math class. We're able to integrate reading and writing. Um, but like we saw at the high school, uh, shift to a block is going to slow down the pace of life for students at Middlebrook in much the same way it did at the high school. We'll have fewer transitions. And that's especially important for our kids who are um, high anxiety kinds of kids and really struggle with executive function and just the daily management of seven or eight periods across a six and a half hour day. Um, we will have the opportunity to reduce time out of stride for students who require intervention or other specialized support. Um, and last, and you know, I think really importantly, moving the data and stats class out of the stride block is going to open up a space of time. And in that space of time, we can introduce a new STEM class that will address robotics and coding really meaningfully. Um, Fran has been chairing the STEM Curriculum Review Committee. Um, and in the needs assessment that she conducted, this was one of the glaring gaps in our curriculum. So as I just said, moving data and staffs will open up the space and we'll have an opportunity to teach into a curriculum area that we know we need to. Um, similarly, and it's a bit of a sidebar, um, on March 8th, we're going to reconvene our Long Range Planning Committee. Um, and it's my intention to use that time to help the Long Range Planning Group, again, look toward the horizon and consider emerging trends and how our curriculum is responding and needs to respond. We already know that we have to improve our STEM offerings, and this will give us an opportunity to think about what else we need to do. Just as an example, um, at the end of November, as I think you all are well aware, we began to hear, uh, hear stirrings about a new AI chatbot, right? Chat, we were just talking about this uh, yesterday, chat GPT. Um, so this is an artificial intelligence technology that stands to be really highly disruptive to the way that we educate. Uh, at a conversation, some of you were present, uh, a couple of our, our high school teachers are really freaked out by this, and so we have to pay attention to this. And I think I use that. Um, as an example of emerging technology, but when, again, you come back to what we're trying to do here as a um, pre-K-12 public education system, one of our obligations is to continue to look outward and ensure that our curriculum is responding to uh, needs as they emerge and ensuring that our kids are going to be prepared for these um, various changes they're going to encounter as they age. So I connect that to the STEM conversation because that's an area that we need to um, grow into and um, we know there's more to come. So what are the other FTE shifts? I think at the top of the list, the budget proposes to absorb the staff that we've funded for the last two years through the ARP ESSER grant. And um, those staff include two classroom teachers at Miller Driscoll. If you recall, when we were struggling with getting to a bottom line a couple of years ago, we made the decision to move two classroom teachers into the grant for the last two years. Those teachers were funded through the grant. We still need those teachers, and so they've got to be built into the budget. We also have 1.45 interventionists sitting in the grant. So it's 1.0 uh, math intervention at um, Sutter Mill. Um, and, you know, 
Jen, when I think two years ago when she originally presented her budget proposal, that was also another position that she'd hoped to have funded through the um, budget, but through the deliberations around the table and, again, attempt to manage costs and needs, we made the decision to fold that into the grant. The .45 interventionist was a newer ad at Miller Driscoll, and that really was coming out of um, the pan uh, needs wrought by the pandemic. And so, you know, as you just heard, we're doing really well, but that intervention program is successful. We're meeting a lot of kids, so we're proposing to hang on to that .45 and build it into the operating budget. And then there was the equivalent of um, you know, 1.0 mental health also in that grant. And um, you've heard lots of conversation around um, some of the acute concerns we have among um, some of our kids around mental health. Um, what exists but wasn't budgeted in the last budget was um, a six pre-K class. And so we saw a need through the Birth to Three program to open up another threes program. Um, so Kathy and Bernadette um, lobbied very heavily to do that. Jen lobbied very uh, alongside them because, right, you work with those kids and you see the need. And so we made the decision uh, over the course of the summer to open up that sixth pre-K class with the understanding that the increase in revenue would offer offset the cost of the teacher. Um, so we're keeping that class. You'll see um, on the pre-K revenue line that revenue is up by, um, I think, 77,000 year over year, which is the equivalent of um, a, a young teacher. And then um, the staff at Miller Driscoll moved heaven and earth to cover the para obligations um, through existing paras. Um, we need to mo we need to f we, we need to um, staff that class the right way, and so um, there is a slight increase in paraprofessionals to cover um, that sixth class. So that is a that is a budget add. Um, just you know, to not belabor this, but just to go in that slide column by column. Um, no changes to um, any administration categorically. Um, the certified teacher change actually reflects a net reduction of 2.0. So if you assume the um, loss of seven FTE at Middlebrook, but and then add three um, at Miller Driscoll, add two at Cider Mill, you get the, the net minus two. Um, in the other certified category, we're showing a 0.4 FTE increase. So first, within that category, I would just note for you, um, there is a shift of 1.0 school counselor from Cider Mill to 1.0 social work and special services. That was just a personnel change we made this year. Um, and then the 0.4 is reflected. There's a 0.1 increase in um, school psychologist. And then there's the equivalent of a 0.3 social work, uh, which is really a transfer from the ESSER grant, and so that nets out to the um, 0.4 FTE increase on that line. Uh, we're not proposing, um, at least at this point in time, any changes to coaches, and then you see the 1.45 addition to interventionists. I just discussed those, so both of those are coming out, of, the 1.45 is coming out of the ARP ESSER grant. Um, OTPT, we're showing a 0.2 reduction there, and those are just vacancies we haven't filled, and then the um, net addition of 1.55 paras that comes from the need to staff the pre-K. And then this year, um, outside of the budget this summer, we added a .8 paraprofessional to staff a young student who moved into the district who requires one-to-one -one support. And so that's where we get the um, 1.55. Um, the support staff line is not showing any FTE change, but there is a change. Um, so we moved, we had a, um, we had a computer technician here at the high school that we carried on our roles that retired. And so we folded his job and that FTE into the Novus contract. And so you'll see an increase um, under contracted services. Um, but we are proposing to add um, additional clerical support to facilities. Um, that, like we've tried to do in so many other areas, we've run our facility shop really, really lean. And so Jose Figueroa is our facilities director. We've tried to give him support through um, one of our pairs at the high school and in some other ways. It's not effective or efficient, and so he needs some dedicated support. So we're proposing some additional clerical support there. So at the end of all of that, the net FTE year over year is an increase of 1.2. So what does that all mean? It's the big reveal. 
With enrollment and staffing in mind, the current proposal stands um, at a, it's, you know, 91 million eight um, or a you know, nearly 6% increase year over year. And as I said at the outset, um, this budget proposal is one of the highest I've, I've ever, it is the highest I've ever proposed by double. Um, so that's why I said it was an initial proposal. We've got some work to do in the next month as we really look at this thing. Um, the next couple of slides are just, um, again, just going to highlight the distribution of um, that budget. Um, and again, no surprise to anybody here, salaries and benefits um, consume nearly 80% of the total of the total budget. Um, the, on the next slide, uh, just the pie chart, so you can see the magnitude of the differences. Um, and then some just dollar breakdown. So we're looking at salaries, um, liability insurance, and um, employee benefits on this slide. The total combined salary lines, um, there are 10 of them in all, and they together represent a $2.3 million increase um, year over year. And the salary increase is the single largest driver of this budget. Employee benefits is the next largest driver, and that categorically accounts for 11 different accounts. I had Lucille put in your budget books um, an account breakdown, so when you're looking at it and you see this, in, you can go back and actually see what the detailed accounts connect to. Um, so there are um, 11 different accounts in the employee benefits category. The largest driver there is group insurances. And so as I mentioned to you at the beginning here, our utilization rate has been much higher over the last year. Um, we did make an initial adjustment, which you'll see a little later on in this presentation, to this line. And as we continue to work with our insurance broker and with our insurance carrier, uh, we've also gone out to bid for insurance. So we're hoping as time marches on here, we'll be able to make a favorable um, adjustment to this line, um, really just to bring that total increase down. Um, but that's um, that remains to be seen. Um, here in these six categories, um, I'll just highlight for you a couple of the major areas. Um, if you call your attention to the equipment line, um, you know, we're showing an increase there of about 295,000. Um, within this equipment line, um, this is where we contain all of our technology purchases. And I would just um, r remind you that um, in previous years, if you go back a couple of years, um, we had had a practice of leasing technology equipment. So our leasing power, if we had a you know quarter million dollar lease, we could spread it over five years and you know really gain about a million dollars in purchasing power, and then. Um, in the last couple of years, we've transitioned away from leasing to purchasing outright. And so um, on this line, you know, there's nothing fancy here. Um, we continue to purchase Chromebooks as we do annually. Um, we're following our teacher laptop replacement plan, so I believe it's the Miller Driscoll staff who are slated to have their um, laptops renewed um, in this next funding year. And then, you know, we've begun um, to take very small steps to replace the smart boards across the district. All of those are coming to the end of their lives. Um, I think the major purchase of smart boards was done before I got here. And so now we're beginning to replace them with um, technology like that. So these flat panel interactive TVs. Um, so when you look at that line, that's where the bulk of the dollars are in the equipment line. What else? Um, so just as a, you'll see in the budget, um, there is a technology offset. So when you get deep into the numbers, you'll see that the um, technology lease line has been zeroed out because we're going to finish paying the last tech lease this year. So while that's showing an increase, we're showing like a $265,000 decrease on the lease line. Uh, so that's some good news. Purchase services. Um, so the top far right there is also um, showing a significant increase. Um, so the purchase services category reflects 13 different accounts. There are two primary drivers in this category. One is the out of district tuition line and the second is athletic transportation. 
You'll note in the budget, we've increased out of district tuition in this proposal by nearly $435,000. And I would just remind everybody that our current budget is frozen because of the increased activity on this line that we discussed some months ago. Athletics transportation has also increased by 144,500, and this is really a reflection of the bus driver shortage and our accompanying need to contract with third-party transportation vendors to get our kids to and from away games. Um, Marie and I are going to be working with STE to come up with a solution because I just I don't see this as a sustainable, um, a sustainable. Um, way to operate our athletics transportation. It's just too costly. So uh, we have to do something differently. So I'm hoping, you know, given a little bit of time through the course of this winter, we can come up with a better solution and be able to take that number down a bit. Um, and then kind of the last item I'll highlight for you here, property services. Um, you're detecting a theme, right? Everything is up. Um, so the property services line increase is the result of a proposal to add additional security cameras at all of our buildings. So, you know, again, Maria Chairs, um, along with Brian Jacobs, a teacher here at the high school, our emergency operations team, and that team annually conducts um, needs assessments in all of the schools. And so one of the needs we've been trying to feed for some time is the need to expand our security camera footprint. So the um, total proposal in this budget for security cameras represents about $233,000. Um, whatever we spend on security cameras, we can submit for some partial reimbursement to the state. Did you tell me it was like 26%? So it's not a, not a huge number we'd get back. But I think as we get into um, the details here, that might be an area we might want to talk about, about staging as we've done with other projects in the past. Um, supplies yeah so let me just go back here so the and the just the the supply account you know it's the supply category is showing you know a, a very slight reduction um, what's you know contained within this line um, you'll see when you get into the budget details um, a pretty substantial reduction in the cost of digital resources um, Fran has done uh, tremendous work looking at our digital resource utilization across the district and then as she always does working with vendors to try to get the best price for the tools that we do use and so the um, the reduction on that particular account is um, north of a hundred thousand um, that reduction in savings is offset by the increase in diesel fuel sadly um, utilities is also up you know we've talked a little bit about electricity and you saw um, you saw the assumption, um, and you're probably experiencing it here in January at home. So one of the questions I think is worth diving into here is what is driving the budget increase? And so, you know, you've heard some explanation about salaries uh, across all of the salary lines, there's an increase of 2.3 million. Um, within that, our primary um, salary category, the full-time salaries, um, that's showing an increase of uh, 1.97 million, which represents 2.2% of the increase year over year. And so um, within that, we've already discussed, you know, you've heard about the staffing changes. So, you know, that cost increase reflects the contracted salary changes. Um, it supports, you know, what is about the current FTE we have today. Um, you know, with some slight additions, we're building in the six pre-K teacher, and then we're adding um, some additional, we're proposing to add, rather, some additional pre-K para staff. Um, but the salary line is really um, the primary driver of the, um, the increase. Next to that is um, health benefits. So that line is showing an increase of 1.67 million. So that's another 1.9% um, of the increase year over year. So those two lines um, in and of themselves represent what, just you know, over 4%. Um, moving on, so electricity, um, our electricity is trending um, about 40% of where we were a year ago. So that represents, um, you know, 0.38% of the increase. And then um, I talked about the uh, equipment line. Let me just see if there's anything else there. Um, natural gas is up. Um, 
fuel is up dramatically, as you know. Um, the substitute line is up by $165,000, and as I mentioned in the opening comment, um, you know that we and every district in the state is experiencing um, a substitute shortage, and so one of the um, strategies that we're proposing, that all of our neighbors are proposing, um, is to increase um, incrementally substitute pay. Um, this is the first year where we had substitutes tell us that they're going to work in other districts because other districts pay more. And so we're trying to just have some parity so we can continue to attract and retain um, substitutes. Um, I think I talked about all of these other lines, so um, I won't go into any of those other details here. Um, but I think summary, you know, everything is more expensive, unfortunately. So is there any good news in the budget? Surely you've got something. There is, right? There is. Look how uh, well our system performs. Yes, well, that's great news, right, about what it's doing. Um, but, you know, again, I just as you kind of go through it, you'll see um, there are a number of lines that are actually showing reductions. Um, I'll walk you through a few of them right now. So, one, um, you know, we, the revenue stream that comes in, um, we have the, the most substantial is the pre-K tuition. So with the growth of the sixth class, um, you'll see a $77,000 increase. Um, so the pre-K generates, um, or we're projecting it to generate $327,000 in revenue this year. So that's great news. Um, the defined benefit line is down significantly, and so this is a fund, Don, you can probably explain this better than I can, this is a fund that is, um, I think, pretty close to being fully funded, so our it's annual, fully it is fully funded. funded. Fully funded. Great. And, and that's um, one of the reasons why the contribution is lower. Right, so our annual contribution to this defined benefit is um, is down significantly by $362,741. So that's great news. Um, as I would mentioned already, um, the technology lease line has been zeroed out, so that's um, another year-over-year um, -year savings on that line of $263,000. And then you can see as you go through, working with the staff here to put this proposal together, um, we tried to squeeze as many of these other discretionary lines as we can, so there's a number of them that are showing um, some very minor but others more modest decreases. Um, so, and we'll yeah, get into those details in the in the budget workshops. Um, and so then, uh, just you know, given the um, substantial increase, I wanted to take a minute and just uh, again talk about where where have we tried historically to pursue efficiencies. So, um, through our our programming, you know, especially you know, most recently in the last five years, our special services programming, we've been able to fill out our continuum of services, as you know. So we created the Community Steps 18 to 21 program. Um, that represents for us cost avoidance because those children used to be outplaced to the tune of $100,000, $120,000 if you factor in transportation. Um, keeping them here in the community, that only allows them to be here um, in our community among their peers, but it also um, reflects um, a lower cost of educating them while while they are ours. Um, similarly, the Genesis program, uh, right, it's also cost avoidance. So rather than sending kids um, to really high cost outplacements, they're here in the community, they're being fabulously educated, and it's probably, um, you know, 40% of what it would be to educate them. Um, outside the district. Um, most recently, the Collaborative Center programs that Andrea and her staff have created um, function the same way. Um, and then some other odds and ends. Um, working with Eric Hawkinson, you know, we shifted our technology hardware model some years ago. So um, we used to have a desktop uh, in every classroom. Teachers also got a laptop. And then we had the smart board and projector. Um, I think last year, two years ago, we finished um, removing all of the um, desktops and um, creating classroom setups that were really driven by a teacher's laptop. Um, so that represented a pretty significant savings. As we continue to um, move out smart boards and projectors as they come to the end of the life and replace them with these flat panel TVs, that will also um, reflect a savings because they're cheaper than the combo package of a smart board and projector. 
Um, beyond that, if you just kind of look across those puzzle pieces, there's you know all kinds of other ways. We um, did well last year um, with our bus contract negotiation. So um, the old contract had reflected 4% increases. The current contract, those increases are um, somewhere around 2.5% or so. Um, so that's good news and savings over time. We uh, renegotiated our copier contract, and so we're in, I think, the second year of that. That'll reflect $300,000 in savings over the life of that contract. Um, I would mentioned already we're going out to bid for insurance. Um, we through the uh, partnership with the town, put solar panels on uh, Miller Driscoll in Middlebrook. Um, Chris Burney presented to, I think, the Board of Selectmen um, a week ago. And um, since those have come online, those have represented pretty substantial savings. I think over $200,000 combined um, in the years that they've been up and running. So even with the incredible increase in the cost of electricity, it would be so much worse if we didn't have the um, solar panels. So that's good news. And there are others. Um, so I offer that to you just as a contextual reflection that you know we continue to look for ways to really um, be as efficient as we can be with the way that we operate our business. So the budget didn't start at 5.99%, um, and you have this in the slides. I won't read through this. I offer this as information. Annually, when we are looking at a budget, I ask the administrators and their cost centers to review their operations, to look at their um, present level of functioning, and to look at their needs, and to generate a proposal. And so. Um, what you see on the screen and what you have in front of you reflect proposals that we removed before we got to this initial 5.99% um, increase. And so again, I offer that to you as information um, just so you have a richer picture of um, where the budget conversation began internally and what some of the decisions um, that I made, this team made, as we were trying to refine um, this, this budget proposal so far. And just a few more other um, contextual pieces here. Um, you know, I also I look at um, how our budget fares, the increases year over year. I look at our um, surrounding towns. And so, you know, the eight-year um, budget increase average, if you like, if you take all of the increases over that period of time, that averages out to 1.27. And so, um, Again, I offer this, you know, as contextual information to say that, you know, is evidence that we've worked hard in this district to present budgets that um, meet the needs, address our goals, and um, cost as little as we can um, try to make it cost while doing those things we need to do. Um, and this budget year is obviously a, an outlier. Um, and then just, again, informationally, um, what you have here are the um, increased comparisons year over year. And then you have, um, if you look at the bottom table, you have the nine-year average of increases um, over our Durga counterparts. And then you have also just where um, current budget proposals are across the DERG. Um, we provide informationally um, the just per pupil spending, and so there's two sources um, that generate per pupil. Um, the Bureau of Grant Management, so you'll see um, the most current data from the Bureau of Grant Management is 21-22. Um, EdSight is the database operated by the State Department of Education. That's typically a year behind, and so you've got just two sources of per pupil information. Um, when I, I look at our per pupil, um, and Lynn had shared this in her town update, um, our per pupil spending um, over time is about in line with where our dirt counterparts are, um, even though our like annual budget increase average is lower than where they are. And I think that's you know primarily for us, it's a reflection of the enrollment decline. Um, but it's another point of information as you're trying to understand what this budget looks like compared to what some other school budgets um, look like in the neighborhood here. Um, and then you know, last but not least, just the
calendar going forward. Um, Ruth had shared some dates, so this information needs to be updated. But uh, we have workshops on January 24th, 25th, and 26th. Um, we'll have uh, another meeting in which we'll do some budget deliberation, and then we'll hear a lot more about the Middlebrook schedule proposal on February 2nd. Um, it looks like the 8th of February, we'll um, have a joint meeting with the Board of Finance. It's the night. And then, oh, is it it's the, it's the, the night? It's oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. So it's correct. Oh, good. All right. Um, and then um, we are scheduling the 16th for um, the Board of Education to make a vote. Um, and at that point, um, that becomes your budget. And then uh, we have the public hearings at the end of March. The uh, Board of Finance will have their mill rate deliberations in early April and the town meeting in early May. <coughs> Are you all depressed now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. That's all I have for you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>